Hello, hello. Today we have a short chat with our good friend Paul Maric, who is professor and the head of uh, critical care at the University of Eastern Virginia. Uh, Paul is a very productive, uh, enthusiastic uh, leader in our field, and uh, he has some very strong opinions uh, about different things, about uh, you know um, nutrition, fluid administration, corticosteroids in sepsis, and actually we would like to focus today uh, on sepsis and COVID-19 and um, discuss these issues with uh, Paul. So thank you for being with us, Paul. And I will ask you first, if you consider uh, severe COVID-19, we are in the intensive care unit, severe COVID-19 as a form of sepsis, of viral sepsis or not? What can you tell us about it? Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Jean-Louis, it's, it's a pleasure. <clears throat> so certainly, you know, bacterial sepsis is due, severe septic shock is due to an immune dysfunction with excessive cytokines. It just so happens that severe COVID, so these are patients who are in the ICU, actually have a severe immune dysfunction with cytokinemia. And it, it's very similar to septic shock. I think the cytokine profile is different, but there is a big overlap. And I think the really important point is that patients are dying from the immune response, not from the cytopathic effects of the virus. So the only way to treat this is to treat the overactive excessive inflammatory response. So in that response, there are, in that respect, there are very similar overlaps between septic shock and severe COVID. Be yeah, we could even add today uh, the possible presence of autoantibodies that just came out a few days ago huh, in science and nature, uh, that there may be autoantibodies. But, okay, uh, you have been a strong advocate of corticosteroids plus vitamin B, theamine plus vitamin C, ascorbic acid, in, uh, in sepsis. Do you recommend the same in COVID-19 then? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's very phase-specific. So in the early phase, the symptomatic phase, we don't recommend steroids because that's a viral replicative phase. Steroids inhibits interferon production. So we know that if you give steroids too early, as was demonstrated in the recovery study, it can be harmful. So timing is absolutely critical. So we recommend steroids once patients become oxygen dependent. So I think yeah. that would be the trigger. Once patients develop pulmonary signs and develop hypoxemia, that should be the trigger for corticosteroids. And you even recommend a, a cocktail, you call it uh, MATH plus, methylprednisolone, vitamin C, theamine, and, and heparin? Yes, yeah, so I think the, the core treatment modality is methylprednisolone, without question. I think the vitamin C and the heparin act adjunctively. We know that uh, COVID-19 activates platelets. You get a profound coagulation, procoagulant state. You get a micro and macro vas vasculopathy. So I think anticoagulation is part of it. Yeah. Whether you full anticoagulation or intermediate dose is somewhat debatable. And I think it should be individualized, but we would recommend at least intermediate dose anticoagulation together with aspirin. Now, the recovery trial indicated that dexamethasone seems to be effective, but you have been recommending methylprednisolone. So the question comes, is there a difference? Should we prefer one agent versus the other? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think there are many reasons why methylprednisolone is the drug of choice. But firstly, I mean, what they did was they did a study, for example, in septic shock. They gave six mics per kilogram of dopamine and compared it to placebo. Uh, and on you say dopamine, I think. I'm just saying as an example. This is oh, okay, 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 yeah. So this would be an analogy to taking a patient who has septic shock 
randomizing him to a fixed dose of dopamine or placebo. Okay. So it was the wrong dose and the wrong drug. Because clearly, like a presser, you have to titrate it to the severity of illness. It's pulmonologists know this. They've been treating inflammatory lung disease for a long time. So using a fixed dose, regardless of the severity of illness, is as absurd as giving patients with septic shock a fixed dose of a presser. It just does not make sense because there's a spectrum. You know, if you look at the CAT scan, there's a profound spectrum from, you know, fleeting peripheral infiltrates to extensive lung disease with dense consolidation. And I think you have to look at the underlying disease. Every patient is different. You can't use the same dose. So how, how would you select the dose then? So I think this, you know, what we do is we do a CAT scan on admission. It's very, very informative. We look at the degree of how extensive it is. Is this ground glass opacities? Is yeah, we all do that. We all do that. But, but how do you adjust the doses yes. of corticosteroids? So, so, yeah, so you know what we would say, if, the, if we're talking about methylprednisolone, if the patient has minor infiltrates or fleeting infiltrates, we'd give an 80 milligram loading dose and then 40 Q12. However, the more severe the infiltrates, the more extensive it is, we would escalate the dose to 80 or 120 or 250, depending on the, the extent of the disease. So the more, the more extensive the disease, the more dense the infiltrates, we believe you need to hit them hard up front. And there is okay. really good data from the Spanish group showing that um, higher dose is more effective. So I think, you know, this is just common sense. The, the more severe the disease, the greater the dose. And the analogy with presses, I think, is very informative, is that the sicker the patient, the more extensive the infiltrates, the higher the dose. So to use a single dose for every single patient is completely, doesn't make any, it's just no, not common sense. But people may say, people may say, okay, but we have the data with this fixed dose of dexamethasone, and you take the liberty to basically alter the protocol that led to a positive trial. So how can you dare? Yeah, so I think it's going back to the dopamine analogy. We know that steroids work. It showed it worked, but we think the wrong dose and the wrong drug. And recently published in Critical Care, your journal, it was a very good paper from the Spanish group, which showed this very clearly, that what you want to do is treat early within 48 hours of the ICU. And they showed clearly a survival benefit with high dose as compared to the standard low dose. Yeah. So they have very good data. So I think their study is very informative because it says one, dose is important and timing is important. And what they clearly showed is if you give it after 48 hours of being in the ICU it was actually harmful. It didn't reduce mortality, but it significantly increased the number of secondary infections. It's really in, in, in line what we're saying is timing is critical. You want to start it when patients are hypoxic. And if you get to them early, you can use a lower dose. If patients present late with extensive infiltration, yeah, yeah you say that. So, in in in, uh, so you would still prefer methylprednisolone to dexamethasone, despite the fact that the data were generated with uh, dexamethasone. Yeah. So, for two, at least two good reasons. One, pulmonologists who've been treating interstitial and inflammatory lung disease use methylprednisolone, and if you look at the pharmacokinetics, methylprednisolone has much greater lung penetration significantly get greater lung penetration than dexamethasone. Secondly, there was a very good genomic study, which they looked at gene expression with SARS-CoV-2, and then they looked at which drugs specifically reversed those genomic changes. And the drug which had the highest effect was methylprednisolone. So this is an, an in vitro genomic study based on SARS-CoV-2. And indeed, dexamethasone was significantly less effective. So methylprednisolone has better lung penetration. It's been used by pulmonologists to treat interstitial lung disease okay. for decades. 
and we have very strong genomic data. And then if you actually look okay. at number, number needed to treat, so if you look at studies comparing dexamethasone versus methylprednisolone, the number needed to treat to save one life is about 20 with dexamethasone. It gets down to about one, or five, one in five or one of six with methylprednisolone. So we yeah, again, people may say that you don't have these data for COVID-19. But my next question, we have only two minutes left. Uh, is thiamine, is vitamin C really necessary or is it okay with, uh, with uh, methylprednisolone or corticosteroids at large? Yeah, so I think methylprednisolone is, is the, the core treatment. We think that high dose vitamin C has adjunctive properties. So if you look at vitamin C levels in COVID-19, they every single patient has as exceedingly low or unmeasurable levels. Yeah. Um, it obviously has very important antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. However, COVID is different to bacterial sepsis. So we are suggesting a much higher dose of vitamin C, much in line with what the Chinese have done and in fact, what Dr. Balomo from Australia has proven. Yeah. So the vitamin study was negative. He hasn't given up on vitamin C and is now using high dose vitamin C in an animal model and in his patients with COVID. Um, so, you know. The okay, very last question. We have 30 seconds left. Uh, anything else? I know you have been an advocate of ivermectin, uh, but. Could we speak about melatonin? Could we now speak about colchicine after the uh, uh, cold corona study? Uh, what about uh, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma? Do you believe in all or none of these? So I'll give you a, a short answer to each. There's a recent study out of New York showing patients in the ICU who got melatonin had a 90% reduction in mortality. So that's with melatonin. With colchicine, it's an interesting anti-inflammatory drug. It's not immunosuppressive. We're not sure of its role yet. You know, we haven't seen the, the data from the study. It's one study. I think it may have an adjunctive role. In the ICU, I'm not sure it has a role if you dose them adequately, adequately with steroids. In terms of convalescent plasma, I think we know categorically it doesn't work. It's a failure. In the last 40 years, there's only one study showing a benefit of convalescent plasma, and that was in Argentinian hemorrhagic fever 40 years ago. So convalescent plasma... Yeah, but in New England, you could see the study from Argentina a couple of weeks ago. Actually, we discussed it at our previous chats just one week ago. Uh, yeah. two, two, two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. And then in terms of monoclonal antibodies, both Lilly and Regeneron, halted their study in hospitalized patients, yeah. it was a trend towards increased mortality, yeah. which is exactly what you'd expect. First, it's not a blood-borne disease. And secondly, how does the antibody get into the mucosal surface? It's a big protein. So it's always been a mystery to me that people would think it would work. So convalescent serum doesn't work. Monoclonal antibodies don't work. I think we need more data on colchicine. I think it's interesting. I think it will be part of the package. I think there's very interesting data on melatonin. It's a very safe drug. So our approach is that you need a, you know, a multi-drug approach to treat COVID. It's a very vicious disease. I don't think there's one single magic bullet. I think you need to use a combination of medications. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul. I will have many more questions, but I think we need to keep it short. It's a short chat. So many, many thanks for having shared sure. your ideas with us. It was very instructive. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And I think, you know, as we said, the steroid question is so important because, you know, the, it's just like septic shock. It would be absurd to use a single dose for every patient. And I think it has to be individualized. Very good. Personalized medicine. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you.